Jesus. <laughs> we didn't go live. What are you talking? Oh, God, you know, doesn't matter how much you try. Look <laughs> for me. She's like, she thinks this is hilarious. Uh, we were talking about. So what you missed <laughs> well, uh, guys, while you were gone. While um, you weren't on the stream. Yeah, sorry, everybody. Uh, all you missed out on is that Pumi had given up. Swearing. <laughs> swearing and meat for Lent. She's going back to the meat on Sunday and the swearing. Maybe <laughs> soon. <week> Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I did give up um, drinking for two and yes. a half months. I kind of, it wasn't so much fell off the wagon as I just decided. <laughs> no, I decided a, a friend of mine had got back from overseas. And he said to me, let's have a drink. And I, I thought, why not? No, I'm an adult. I've given up uh, drinking for two and a half months, which it just proves that I can. That's all. It wasn't difficult. I didn't miss it. But I suddenly thought, nah, I did come to the very, very Age. <laughs> sad realization. <laughs> that actually a lot of people are extremely boring when you're sober. <laughs> Especially the sort of people you spend, you know, weekend time with. Let's just put it that way. Do you agree? No. Yeah. I have lots of sober people in my life and they're not boring. I went to, I was telling you, I went to Gunza with a friend of mine last week. We drove yes. out, we drove out on, on Thursday. Now, this is a place that is not on everyone's tourist destination. Yo, guys, and it should. <laughs> it should. Beautiful. The, Beautiful. Although the, the cars in the Eastern Cape are a law unto themselves, they out are of control. out of control. I think they should be shot. Um, I think that people shouldn't be allowed to let their lives Well, stop. they will be shot and eaten as soon as you just start eating meat again. Then someone <laughs> will shoot them and we'll be back to normal. It's your fault that there's so many cars. <laughs> but the, and it's a, it, guys, it's an 11 hour drive. If you saw it's a long, it's long, a long drive, hmm. but it's a beautiful drive. And okay. the friend I drove with doesn't drink at all. Okay, well, that's probably a good thing that they and drive most of the way and you no, were drinking. I drove. <laughs> I drove. I love driving. I drove. I drove. And we spent the entire weekend together. And on our way back, she, she was with um, her, her nieces on a phone call mm -hmm. because they were prepping the one niece for a um, an interview. Oh, wow. They, so the, all the nieces, there were like six of the them job on interview. the call. A, no, a bursary interview. Oh, okay. <laughs> they were prepping right. the one niece. And because we were still laughing about something else when the, when the stream came on, one of one of the of her sisters asked, "How can you guys spend so much time together and still be able to laugh with each other after an so, entire like?" What's the answer? She's fun. Yeah, look, <laughs> we that, like that is, each other. She's that is true. Fun. I mean, there are very few people in my life who I could spend a whole weekend with and not. Really? Yeah. And so um, we both weren't drinking and we could still laugh. No, like that. Okay. So, so let me just qual qualify this because I don't think that um, everybody's boring just because I'm not drinking. I mean, that would be ridiculous. But it does make the boring people seem more interesting. <laughs> Whereas the interesting people stay interesting, whether you're sober or mm, drunk. Right? Mm. But the boring ones, the ones who you think, oh, no, there's that guy. Funny. Like I saw someone at the gym yesterday. <laughs> and I haven't seen this guy for ages. And you know when you see someone in the distance and you're like, oh no, I hope, I hope he doesn't even recognize me. You know, just 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 carry. Because it's not like I have a problem with him or anything, but he's just uh he's one of those people you don't Do want to see. He doesn't recognize you. Well or he doesn't catch your eye. Both. I just don't want to have like he's just boring. And I thought, uh and then he did see me and I had to talk to him. Ugh. So that's when you go, I could de definitely, not that I would be drinking in the gym anyway, but I could have made that easier on myself if it was a social situation sure. and I was drinking. Because I, 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 I have actually more patience when, I'm, when I've had a few drinks. And I'm more relaxed and, and there's not such a control freak thing going on. Yeah, that is. But you, you've been to Klinsa and apparently here, Nico says, I used to work there for a, four, a few years. 
I had the wildest parties there, but yes, the cows sleep on the road as you enter the place. Yeah, dude. Out of control, hey? Everybody was what happened to the, the cows. What happened to the herd boys of old? Like, who wait, would wait, make they sure these are cows... reckless. These herd boys mm -hmm. are reckless. They're sleeping on the job. They like I'm telling you, I was everybody warns you about the cows. Yeah. So, and and you don't in my mind, I'm just like, yeah, I've driven into rural areas before. You know how to you know you have to watch out for the cows, but yay. Yeah. <laughs> they sleep on the road they're everywhere and and you, you know cows actually the, their life isn't they, they don't necessarily go to sleep when we go to sleep so they just i don't know this about cows you don't fill me no cows. fill me in this is news i don't really think about cows that often we <laughs> drove <laughs> might might surprise you to all i think of when i think of cow is a great, steak great machine for turning grass into steak that's honestly, and I know there are lots of animal rights activists who listen to the show are going to get upset with me. And there are probably some people who are very, um, are very uh, kind, caring sort of people who say cows have wonderful personalities and long, beautiful eyelashes and they're sweet, lovely creatures. They may well be, but to me, they're steak. Yeah, so, you know, they, they are awake. They're always chewing, you know, this always ruminating. Chewing. Ruminate. Always chewing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So in the deep dark, we, we we went out on the one night. We were actually there for a series of parties. Oh, nice. Good for you, <laughs> Pumi Mashiko. Good for you. On the night we drove back, it was after midnight. And as we just, like, drove into the... <laughs> Cows in the road, just standing there, mm. just standing there, staring, chewing. It's quite a weird. What did you think of that? <laughs> quite a weird, like, it's just like, this is insane. It's oh, crazy. Oh in between God. the people's lives. And it's, you know, it's, it's not, it's not rural, rural, like some of the places we've been to kind of KZN areas. Uh -huh. they, because there's, Punta East is is actually quite developed. Okay, it's got and, and there's. <laughs> it's not like I'm never gonna go, but thanks. <laughs> like thanks, you know. Ah, oh, so listen, <laughs> let's just focus on everyone else's now problems. Now that we've had, <clears throat> now that we've had the cow wusa. Yeah, I mean, maybe the cow thing, the cow discussion, is a necessary one. Who knows? Uh, there could be people this morning who really need to know about these cows that uh, you encounter. If and you're driving into the sure, place. sure, sure. Then you need to know. And these East things. London. And, and East, East London. And driving into East London. Like East I mean, London's a big city, guys. I've, and there are cows on the you, road. You, you've, you've hit on like two things I really don't care about. The Eastern Cape and cows <laughs> in, in the first five minutes of the show this morning. Good Why? work. Why? Um, so there are places with big problems and people with big problems. I mean, we have got like unbelievable tumult going on in the rap community at the moment. Yo. Sweet Jesus. Uh, it looks like all the, the the all the greats are just. Cat Williams has ruined everything. Cat Williams. You told I, us to pay I, attention to this guy. I actually want to go back and watch that. <laughs> Cat Williams interview. It's like he's the Nostradamus of. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, he he, he kind of said to me about the Kendrick Lamar thing. Is like blowtorch, just took a blowtorch to yep. everything. That's, that's what he's done. That's what Cat Williams came out with the mm -hmm. blowtorch. He was like. He said in that interview, P. Diddy P. and all of them. Right. I got the receipts. Right. Got the receipts. Yeah. <laughs> and, and everyone was like, got the receipts to what, Fred Williams? Uh huh. Well, now we know. But also, if you, if, over the years, if you've like listened to Cat Williams, you know that Cat Williams does not lie. He's crazy, but he doesn't lie. Yeah, he doesn't okay. lie. Fair enough. He says insane things that you think, no ways and then if you just like scratch on a reddit <laughs> you're like uh -huh. i used to i used to walk <laughs> past a certain building on it was on broadway just below 57th street and it had uh sean john mm. on the building right mm. and then you knew his apartment was up there but also the head his offices for everything for his music business his clothing company all of the other stuff that he was doing. His Diageo partnerships. Right, his Diageo partnerships. I mean, this is this is one of the most successful business people to come out of music. And I remember when he was at his height in the 
I don't think it's unfair to say that he reached his peak somewhere in the early 2000s because really P. Diddy didn't, he'd do a lot of collaborations because, yeah, and things. Because he's not, he's not like a rapper rapper. He's no. not, he's not that. He's no, more but, of a producer. But you know, uh, everybody knows uh, we ain't going nowhere. We ain't going nowhere. It turns out you might be going to prison because we're bad, bad boys for life. life. Um, I saw a, a um, because Bad Boys 3 is coming yeah, out and right. I saw a little promo, I think, with Will Smith and thingy, and, and they didn't have Bad Boys. I'm sure they took it out. The I'm back. sure they'll be taking out Bad Boys. So all of P. Diddy's commercial relationships are at an end. All of them. And he, I mean, I don't know if this has been updated since I last checked, but up until last night, they couldn't find him. They didn't know where he's gone. His jet just kind of landed somewhere obscure. Hmm. So we don't know exactly where he is. Uh, hmm. The cops have been raiding all of his houses. So, okay. First, this is first a big clue. story. The uh, first clue you, that you, something major was going down. You do not need to be a fan of P. Diddy's to, to think that this is a big story. This is a big story. This Fox and it, News it, did a 10-minute like, and, 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 and explain the, now. But for me, as the concentric circles around someone like P. Diddy start to spread, it encompasses people like... T.D. Jakes. Well, that one we knew about, but now. Yeah, but we kind of we. Jay Z. We like, Jay Z. He's like on the fringes of this. Lots of other very important people. Asha, Justin Bieber. Again, the Clintons. <laughs> Let's just say it, because you know this thing doesn't stop with the musicians. It goes all the way to the politicians. So, I knew this was this this was properly a. a big thing mm -hmm. when I saw the initial footage of a coordinated clamp down in multiple properties on multiple mm -hmm. I was just like mm, it's going down for real because if you have to have a coordinated multiple simultaneous clamp down right. it means you also don't want the people on those various properties calling each other to say yo it's going down. Right. Shred the papers. <laughs> well, that's what's happening. <laughs> Apparently, his son, though, is not bothered. He's just kissing his girlfriend. <laughs> you saw that stuff, right? The, 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 the son, Christian Combs, is just like tongue deep into his girlfriend. What can he do? Uh, while, they, while the cops are busy raiding what the place. What can he do? Be like, maybe, you should, kid. <laughs> maybe you should just check in on your dad there. Be like, you know, I'm just you know what kid. I mean? <laughs> Jesus. Something else. So, all right, that's going on. And we haven't finished the discussion either because there's still loads the of stuff that's all happening. Um, then, uh, of course, we've got to catch up on some stuff because we didn't have a show last week. So, <sighs> surprise, surprise, Vladimir Putin won the Russian election. Are you surprised? I mean, it well, shocked me. Just I, a little. I can't believe. And by what? As 80... an independent candidate, too. <laughs> and what? By 87%? As was... an as an independent candidate. And I wondered if just that, the winning well, as an independent candidate, gave all our independent candidates yes. kind of a view that right. this, this is possible. You can do this. <laughs> That's the inspiration for our independent candidates. Mm. Huh? Yeah. But Vladimir Putin really doing a landslide victory. We haven't seen numbers like this since the days of Stalin. So... <laughs> Well done, Tim. Great news. Uh, why do you think okay. he, Why do you think he did so well? Uh, uh, Tucker Carlson. <laughs> Tucker Carlson. Maybe, maybe that Tucker Carlson really? interview was just such a, hmm. you know, eye opener for so many people about the man. Jay, I mean, you think it was Tucker Carlson? I think it was Tucker. All Carlson. Right. Well, it's the Tucker well. Carlson effect. I, I am. I'm going to take your word for it. I can't imagine that within Russia, Tucker Carlson had so much of an impact. <laughs> anyway, I, I just think this is a real move. And then, of course, your other favorite story, uh, which goes on and on, and we haven't done an update on since the great video was released of oh. Princess Kate. In fact, it was released on Friday last week, where she said <laughs> she has cancer and she's been in treatment and she wanted to tell her kids first, and that's why she's been so quiet. But people are not buying it. They're saying, no, it's it's AI. I mean, I suppose there is a quarter of the internet, say a quarter, it might even be a full fourth of the number of people on the internet who just will never believe anything. 
And I had this discussion on Monday, we're not going over it again, about how we don't know what truth is anymore. We've completely lost our moorings. But this story, you were the one who alerted me to it. I was paying no attention to the royal family for the first half of this year. Uh, well, first quarter of this year, as it turns out. But you have forced me to have to look at this stuff, and now it's pitching up on my feed. Bye-bye. And now I'm getting constant updates about how you can see the ring in some of the video footage, and then sometimes it's gone. <laughs> the eye. And the background, never, nothing moves. Come no, on. It's in a studio. Look what you've got. No, we know this. We Look know what you've that got it me in into. A, it's in a studio. All right, so tell me, tell me, tell me your latest on this. You bring me up to date. You're my, you're my connection here. Go on. Listen, right now, ne, there is, there is so much because Prince Harry was also mentioned there in, in the, P Diddy in the P yeah, Diddy that's stuff. Right. There is so much stuff going on, and all I want to know about the royal family. Is what the hell, guys? What is going on? They like at this point, Lizzie's gonna come back. She's gonna have to come back and kick everyone's ass. Did, did she leave at the right time? First of all, <laughs> I'm thinking more about because I, I don't think that whatever Kate's got, I don't think she's like terminal, right? I mean, certainly that's so the one. thing about a cancer, the thing about saying she's got cancer hmm. is cancer is scary and life threatening oh, yes. and and all of those things. But you can go into remission. So yeah. cancer is one of those things. But, that, but apparently, so, so apparently the, cancer. the king though has pancreatic cancer. Yeah, which, that's that's tickets. like that's so tickets. he's gonna have a nice short reign. I mean, we were talking about this the other day, and yeah. and I think about him a lot because I think here's this guy who spent his whole life, seventy five years, waiting to take the job. No, I mean it's just it's Shakespearean. <laughs> it's so awful. And now he's uh, you know, <laughs> got limited time. I, I, I really, that to me is very, very sad. That, well, I think therein was his main problem, was the waiting to take the job. He could, he could have, he, he really could have had a, a full life, a great life. Well, he did. He didn't have a shit life. Come on, yeah, let's be but, fair. But my point, How no, hard is it to be except, the Prince of Wales? Except for the fact that if you are in a constant state of anxiety. And waiting. And waiting mm. for, for, for your life to start. Your purpose. Yeah, then. But he didn't have to. Let this be that a lesson. A let th let this be a lesson to all of us. Because stress is the thing that uh, brings on death, right? And in various forms. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to become one of those esoteric people who says that cancer comes from stress, but we, we know yeah. it can. It can. But listen, it can. stress is the worst thing in the history of humanity. And therefore, live your life right now. Don't wait for tomorrow. Don't wait for the big thing that you've been hoping for your whole life to happen. Start now. Squeeze every drop of fun out of life right now. Don't have regrets. Get into it. Or, or just relax. And here be we like are. The cows of <laughs> be like the cows of Prince. But but also on the cusp of a weekend, a long weekend, because mm. we've got tomorrow off and Monday. And many people will be spending time with family. Mm -hmm. I saw Alan Ford yesterday afternoon. We had a meeting and uh I said to him, What are you doing this weekend? Ellen, he said he's spending Friday with the family. They're doing all the things, going to mass. I was gonna. I was Good actually Catholic. gonna go to mass on Saturday. It's yes. one of my favorite services because um, yes. the church my mother goes to, which I went to for many many years in Pimville, has an amazing choir. And like the Christmas carols, I like the Easter songs, and they only come by once a year. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. So I was gonna go to mass and all of that, but I went to a funeral yesterday um, at the church. One of my mother's friends passed away, and and I I had my quota. I filled my quota. You're, you're okay now. For the yeah, weekend. I filled my okay. quota. the The service was amazing. The church choir was there. All of the things, all the touch points, baby. All the touch points. So hey, yeah. I'll be spending Saturday. I had a dream last out. night. I had a dream about <laughs> chocolate, which I've never done before. So Ooh, I think it's because Easter. it's the Easter egg advertising. I'm telling you. Um, and by the way, uh, I, one of our listeners sent me an email yesterday because I had I didn't sleep on Tuesday at all, and I couldn't work out why I arrived here. Sorry, Monday night. Uh, I arrived here on Tuesday morning, exhausted and finished like an hour of sleep, and I couldn't figure out what had happened. And our listeners are so smart; they pay attention to everything. On Monday morning's show, 
Mashiani, Mash was in here. And he told us about something called frogging. Okay. Do you know what this is? Mm. When I heard Mash saying it, I thought it's got to be something sexual. <laughs> but it isn't. So frogging, and I'll get to how this relates to my not sleeping. But frogging is where someone lives in your house and you don't know. They live in the roof or they live in the basement ah, or they live in I've, a I've, spare room that you never go into. Or, or like an outside. Or an outside, out, yeah. Underneath the house. Right, a crawl of, space yeah, type yeah, thing. Yeah. So Mash was telling us that these videos of these people who would they put, put up cameras eventually because this woman suspected there was someone like raiding her fridge. So she put a camera in the kitchen and this, this creature comes out from the trap door. Creature? And no, a person. Okay. You. You. <laughs> Baba. Uh, but it looked Words like. Words are important it here. It looked like a. <laughs> Words are important here. <laughs> Did you just get like what? shivers up your spine? I just saw um, a column. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's something like that. And it climbs out of the roof and then it goes to the fridge and it helps itself. And then it climbs up and it leaves no trace. And this woman was like, I didn't know. And for, for all she knows, it could have been weeks, months that this thing was living Whoa, in the house. But how do they get in? I, <laughs> you're asking me. Maybe that's what freaked me out. I, I was so freaked out. Look, I don't like people in my house when I invite them into my house. So you can imagine how this might have bothered me on a psychological level. And so one of our listeners very acutely observed that this is probably why I didn't sleep on, on Monday night. I, I, I was suppose. thinking about the frogger in, in the ceiling. So And when you and you've got a big house <laughs> oh, and it's just you and Alice. It's just me. And Alice. Oh, well, Alice is I mean, she here she barks all the time, which makes me think. Listen, Mojo's an old man, <laughs> he's barking all the time. I don't know what's Maybe going we've on. both got froggers in our house. But so frogging, right? Because <laughs> this is you, you know this this is a, a big thing. In the states, that it it seems to be taking over. Mm. How people are just all these houses that are empty. People, people are squatting. People are squatting, yeah. and and we have this here in Joburg. We have lots of squatters. Oh, especially in the CBD. In these, in, no, 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 here in the suburbs, baby, in the burbs, yeah. Just people who move in and you can't get rid of them. Uh, yeah, yeah. And and I think there was a thing about it. In the Sunday Times, anyway, or mm. Card Blanche, one so of those it's, old media it's, it's types. It's a big problem. <laughs> when you see it on Card Blanche, maybe. you know it's real. Yeah. <laughs> but, but that is that that might be a thing that would keep you up at night. I'm telling you, no, it freaked me out completely. I was I was very unhappy, and and I only realized that when I got this email. You know, sometimes other people are able to see things about you that you don't see. Mm. And when I saw oh, no, this, because when you mm. said creature, yeah, but I, I immediately, creature. I either thought like, <laughs> do, what's his name, Dobby? Yes, Dobby and, and Harry Potter. I thought Potter, about yeah. Dobby mm. and I thought about Gollum, and so it That's was it. a little bit because again, driving out into the Eastern Cape, you know, you drive through Hobbit country. No. so so the Hobbit's been on my mind. Jesus. <laughs> well. uh, there's, there's so much more to get into on this front too. But I, I, I can't help thinking with all of this squatting and people living in each other's houses and in each other's space, there's a big story in the news this morning. Apparently in Paris, they tried to, to deport some illegal immigrants. And the other illegal immigrants fought back, fought back and like started physically attacking the immigration authorities. And I'm like, the world... Pumi, you often say, when are the aliens coming? Well, the illegal aliens are already among us. This is the But yeah. the aliens, aliens, the outer space aliens, they're coming. I'm telling you it's coming. I even spoke to a friend of mine who I, I do regard as a very sensible, very reasonable, grown up. honest, grown-up. Like, like, this is a person you could trust. I would give them my house keys and they wouldn't frog. They'd look after it. <laughs> and there wouldn't be anyone else. Messing with my stuff. I honestly is one of the people uh, I have have worked with for nine odd years uh, professionally and and personally. We've got a friendship, and he's got he's a responsible person. He has a couple of kids, been married. He's a very very together, orderly, not insane person, and he is absolutely convinced that there are aliens, 
and that they have got a plan and that they've been involved for a long time. And I got to get him on the show. He won't do it because he's worried about what other people will think. They're going to think he's insane, but I'm telling you, he knows, he knows what he's talking about. And I don't think he's an idiot. So Gareth, I'm starting to think maybe we should all be paying attention to the aliens. Gareth, I'm just, not so wacky. This, this, this year, and you know, when I wrote, when I was thinking about yesterday and, and today's show, <laughs> and I was thinking about the fact that it's going to be the 1st of April and it's, we are one quarter. We are just one quarter. That number's come up a lot this morning. Into 2024. Yeah. And already the amount of nonsense. Nonsense. Where's my stop nonsense t-shirt? The amount of I'm nonsense. Don't worry. We have had to deal with this year. You you actually, if you think about it on the top of your head, you can't actually think about the nonsense you have to and then that was this year guys this year alone this that is why this is the year that the oh, aliens come oh my god uh let me tell you uh nico says pumi thought that creature thing was a togolosh probably Baba. Uh, that, Baba. Scares, that scares me i remember watching lesilo when i was a kid <laughs> lesilo and I mean, I couldn't speak Swana, but I remember watching that show. And that freaked show was out. freaky. Yes, us. The first, the, yes, the first two seasons mm. were quite freaky. The other thing in those eighties, because we, we didn't have all oh the tech. God. Remember here in South Africa, we I, didn't have all the tech. It's even those sangomas in the in the Henry Pele with, with the glowing eyes. And you remember the no teeth and the those umtagatis. <laughs> Also, you're just a you're just a te- you're a wee teenager. That kind of Scared stuff. Scared the hell out of me. So Signet says, Gareth, imagine someone taking a massive dump in your bathroom while you're sleeping. That's like all my worst fears in one. What are you trying to? Now you're gonna ruin my Thursday night sleep. What's wrong with you people? No, you're never going. I'm to never sleep. gonna sleep again. <laughs> I think that there are people in our audience whose whole job it is, is to upset me. <laughs> Pete says, did you check your ceiling? You see? That's what I'm talking about. Nico says, my boss went for a walk with his dogs, came back and found a dusty under his stove. What? <laughs> under his stove. Luckily, not the togolosh. <laughs> <sighs> okay, Grace says, we have a few squatters in Cape Town and the liberals here are always trying to stop the cops from moving their tents, etc., sending them to a shelter because shame, it makes them feel yucky. Yeah, you know what? Um, Cape Town is such a place of contradiction, and we're going to have in the burning platform later. Um, I'll be honest and say to you, they weren't our first choice for this morning. We were trying to find other parties, but they're all busy. And we're trying to talk to all the party leaders. So obviously the leader of this party is a minister, and she's not available. But we're going to speak to a guy we've spoken before, we've spoken to before on the show, Brett Heron, who's from the good party. But I thought, you know, actually it's quite appropriate that we have the good party on this morning because mm. you and I were in Cape Town two Fridays ago and you saw their poster. I saw the poster. I spoke about this with uh, Jack Mutlante on Tuesday and the poster says, vote for Auntie Pat. Right? That's their whole line. And I would posit that we gave her that Auntie Pat. I think we did. Hey? I think we gave her that Auntie Pat. Uh, you must remember this burning platform has been going 10 years and we've seen a lot of politicians come and go. And now she's owning it. I've interviewed Patricia a little on a number of occasions, uh, not since she's become minister, but I would like to know what she has planned because actually, what does the good party stand for these days? And I think about these squatters in Cape Town and I think about, the Cape in general, the, there's a huge thing going on. I saw Musi Maimane on Twitter saying that John Steenhazen doesn't own the Cape. Yes, it was he, uh, Gareth, okay. I saw Gaten McKenzie do, saying he owns the Cape. <laughs> we're like, supposed to do the news headlines, but I think maybe we must just take a, a five-minute breather because last week, Thursday, was a public holiday. But it was also one of the busiest news days yes, yes. we have seen in a long time. Because we woke up to the news of uh, Nosi Vuema Pisa Ngagula. Which Bantu Holomisa told us about. Set 
right here and said she's running all over this. So let me just <laughs> re remind everybody, uh, we may not be a news channel, but my God, we break the break news. Break the sometimes. stories here. Bantu Holomisa told us about this a whole week before. And nobody listened. And then suddenly the news starts reporting it a week later. Uh, just saying you should be paying attention if you aren't already. Uh -huh. The general sat here and he said that the speaker is avoiding prison. Mm -hmm. The police are looking for her. Mm -hmm. And I, it, when he said that, I thought, okay, I don't know what that's about, but <laughs> we wake up to the news, raid at her house. She must hand herself over. I was like, what? Mm -hmm. That's quite a big deal. That the is speaker, the big story. The speaker is the head of the legislative branch in the country, one of three branches of government. It's an important story. Anywhere else in the world, this would make headlines for three, four weeks in a row. And yet she's already managed to have nothing happen mm -hmm. because, mm -hmm. of course, she's very connected, which shows you again, we have two systems of justice in this country. But yeah, that was only one story. What else? Terrorist attack in Russia. Oh my God, that was huge. What? Which now it turns out they were ISIS. This is after the man was beaten and tortured and he said he is Vladimir Zelensky's brother. And like... But even Putin has said, okay, looks like they're ISIS. Yeah, right. Which, I mean, he had every reason to try and blame it on Ukraine. Even he says it isn't. So I think we can take that as truth. You know how people are always like, what is true? What is true? Well, I think in this case, that's about right. Surprise, surprise, another Islamic terrorist. Okay. Um, Floyd Shebambo being recalled out of running the campaign KZN. in KZN and being brought back home to, you know. Because you and I have heard... We've spoken about this on the Burning Platform already. We've heard that the internal goings-on of the EFF are not so calm and cool and collected. Now, that's big. And, and by the way, uh, who was the, uh, the, the, the member of parliament who they've recalled as well because she had that argument on uh, Naledi Chiwa. Naledi, 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 Naledi. So she was not right. recalled. She, she was not recalled. She was asked to, to write an apology. She was asked to, um, to her atonement. Mm. Was a public apology, a gazebo, which which she did, and and in her apology, for us at least the Twitterati out here broke open or, or scratched open a piece of the surface of what we've always thought about this party. It became big news. She had to get another smackdown. And on Monday, when we saw the party lists, she's number 200 hmm. on the I mean, list. Even Carl Niehaus is above her. In order for her to get in, <laughs> Carl Niehaus is above uh, Mzwanele and oh, Mkwebane. You're joking. I'm not. Has he moved up? True story. He, he, he is. He's, he's, he's. Carl Niehaus has moved up. If, Usisiwe Mkwebane and, and um, Mzwanele money. If. No. The, if the EFF you astonish me, <laughs> <laughs> if the EFF's performance in this election is stagnant, is exactly the same as it was the last time we had a national election, Mzwanele and Mkwebane will just scrape through. They're like number 40, 40 42 on the list, and the, and today the EFF have I think forty six people in parliament Yo. but in order for Bangani naledi chirwa to make it back into parliament at number 200 nah, on that eff they, they list to win. they would have to get every available seat from from every other party <laughs> <laughs> oh my god but, but you know why why the recalling of floyd is big from kzn because KZN is so deeply contested, but KZN is actually a big part of the puzzle in our national election. Mm. That's why everybody's having their um, their manifestos at Moses Mabida, because the KZN vote mm. is a big chunk of what it looks like in South Africa. We had a conversation with Wayne Sussman the other day at our office, and he was telling us that if you get 35%, mm of the KZN vote, you get 5% of the national yeah, vote. It's big. That, that, it's huge. 
like and people haven't factored that in yet. I, I see uh Zilezuma is busy making huge noise. She's even posting pictures of her with Fiki in there just to mess with him. Uh MK won a significant victory. This is why we're doing news headlines. Um Dalimpofu, their advocate, was arguing that the ANC doesn't own Mkonto Wesizwe as a as a trademark. It's funny, hey, like the ANC is always telling us how they're a party of the people. Uh, they have comrades, socialist <laughs> values, but my God, capitalism. They're a broad church. Broad church. But capitalism always wins here because if you want to own your trademarks, suddenly ownership of things really matters, even for the ANC. And they don't care about your ownership of things, but when they own something, they want it to be taken terribly yeah. seriously by the courts. So just, you know, these are not serious people. I also wanted to ask you, because this is something that came up, and we haven't really gone into the depths of this story. It's also sort of disappeared off the, on the international agenda. But Haiti, because we kind of mentioned it, and it's been mentioned in the comments here by somebody, you guys were talking about the cannibalism, and there was actually cannibalism. The guy who's in charge of the rebels who... Barbecue. <laughs> Barbecue. His name is Barbecue, yes. But not because he's a cannibal. <laughs> it, uh, oh, like it matters. If, <laughs> let's, sorry, let's just get the nomenclature around this no, terrifically no, evil warlord, right? No, okay, yeah. Not because, it's not because he's been eating people and brying them. It's because his father ran a. Shisanyam. Guys, there's so much to talk about. Guys, oh, <laughs> do you hear me say that first quarter, three no, months, three no. months? We are in enough. month number it's three. Enough, we can't, we can't do this. Uh, okay, Musi is gathering some serious cachet. Uh, he's slowly becoming the trustworthy guy, which is nice to see, but he's got no chance. Okay, so that's interesting. Carl is picking up that um, Musi is actually going up in his estimation. You, oh, why? you because... saw Musi, uh, Stianazen, and Gaten McKenzie in one night the other day. In one room. They all shat themselves for Pumi. I mean, this is... <laughs> no, the funniest thing is that, <laughs> is that all three of these leaders of major political parties, when I introduced Pumi to Gaten, he goes, oh, this is Pumi. You're so small. <laughs> That was funny. He thought you were 20 foot tall and terrifying and intimidating. And guys, I'm actually taller in person. I That's know when you funny. see me on the screen, I don't, I'm actually, I'm taller. Did you in talk person. to Musi? It's did, also did because you, people. Do like, you have any words with Musi? No, Musi was actually, I, I did have words with Howie. Musi was very, very quiet. I mean, I almost didn't see him. I almost didn't see him there. Hard not to see uh, Gaten because he's loud. And it's hard not to see Stenazen because he's huge. And I don't mean Stenazen is tall. I mean he's wide. Rotund. Definitely. I've brought this up before, so it's not as if I'm only doing this now. And I'm, it's not because I'm fat shaming either. I've said this to his face, mm. right? Uh, and then Felix in the comments. I always take note when someone called Felix has something to say. He says, Gareth, can you consider doing some more research on OHM in an interview with the leader, Lauren? Well, I've got, I've been spammed by OHM. Hey, no, no, no. It's a, it's a political party. They've, I know, they've but they spammed you. Yeah. They, I mean, I'm getting emails every other day. And guys, we're on to it. Don't worry. Uh, the producers are, are talking to OHM. But really, on the scale of things, OHM are like, you know, I mean, even smaller than the good party, for all we know. So we'll, we'll get So, there. look, the, the list is out. The list of, of um, if you go on elections. Or oh, the, the ballot. The, the list of who's on the ballot right. is there. Um, and, and when I first saw it, All Game Changers was on there, which is the other two. That's twin. Duduzane. That's Duduzane, right? So, the whole Zuma family. Basically, <laughs> politics is a family business. And... <laughs> But yesterday, it seems, and there was, you know, there's there's a guy who is an absolute If you know scammer. someone, just hang on, if someone just landed arbitrarily <laughs> and listened to the first 43 minutes of this morning's show, they would think, this is, this planet, this planet must be destroyed. <laughs> just say, you know, like you brought up the other twin, and like, what is this? This is South Africa. Barbecue, Kate Middleton, uh, it's insane. Vladimir Putin. There's too much. Sorry, I interrupted you. Candace Owens is another one. 
Sweet Jesus. What's going on there? My pillow says, I watched the Candace Owens video with the uh, Barkley guy. What a shit show. Again, so much. <laughs> barbecue is coming up. Very popular subject, barbecue. <laughs> Guys, I still have three days. Can we? I still have three days to go. Let us not have a meat conversation. Uh, <laughs> Tabo says, you can't be surprised by Haiti. Come on, there's no food there, let alone meat to barbecue. Guys, guys, guys. <laughs> For guys, me, they're guys, upsetting you. Guys. Uh, will OHM lead the resistance, says Signet. <laughs> Sandile Lee agreeing with me, he's quite fat. Yeah. And Pete says, and I'm, I'm with Pete, don't trust fat leaders. Mm. Can't. You And then, then we, we have a serious problem in this country. Big one, because there are lots. There are very few. Very who are few in people. shape. Julius used to be, and he, he got into shape. His credit. That's one thing I always he give. Did, him. He Remember, did. Remember, we made the comment. But on, although he's he's again he's regressed slightly. Listen, we made the comment on this show first. <laughs> uh, he was sitting opposite me, and I said, "Hmm, he picked up quite a lot of weight." And I don't think that was necessarily the reason, but we may have been the last straw that broke the camel's back. And then he went off. He was on a strict diet. He did exercise. I think cycling. I think he, he, he started cycling. In fact, cycling. he got so thin, people said, ah, he's got slow puncture. Oh, yeah, cool, and, then, <laughs> and then he was like, no, I'm not ill. I just lost the weight, which is discipline. Mm. If you can show discipline there, you can show discipline in, in but other he, places. He, he, has he has regressed slightly mm. in the, the past couple of months. He, I can see him like going back to... And this is the thing about like... This is the thing about like serious diets and and hard work and da, da, you you have to it's a lifestyle choice, Baba, because then you just go back. If your lifestyle doesn't stay changed, you just go back to what you used to be. My um, and, and and he he was in the news two days ago for not knowing the price of bread or that bread is vet um exempted. That that was yeah. He got into big trouble for that. Plus, speaking are... of fat people, he was on Anella's show yesterday, and um, Anella's also lost weight. She has no, she has shame. Um, apparently, she was very buddy buddy with him and acknowledged, among other things, that she's regularly attended brides at his house. Not that it's hard to get Anella to come to a bride, but at his house. So, talking about. You know, John Stianhazen and Anele and with Julius when he was fat and all of this. My my sister's boyfriend uh, send, sends me, whenever he finds anything about pork, I can embark on a pork world <laughs> tour with us. Then he says to me, it looks like John Stianhazen's campaign is going well. <laughs> so whenever whenever pork comes up, he comes up. Um, <laughs> we're very unfair on this show. Uh, in terms of, of uh, the way that we go after people's uh, behavior in the personal and private realm. Mm. But if you're a politician, I'm afraid you kind of open the Fair door, game. you know, Fair and game. and I expect uh, nothing less. Uh, Sandila says, come on, Gareth, Anela got herself together. She did, and she's terrific, and I have no problem with Anela. I want to be clear about that. Mm. I just like to tease her like she teases me occasionally. We get on fine. Mm. There's no controversy there. Uh, maybe Mazotti You had know who else has lost? Who? A lot of weight. And Ooh. she was on Jimmy Kimmel, I think. Uh, Oprah Winfrey. Yeah, but she's on Ozempic now. Ozempic. She's on Ozempic. Sh I wonder uh, if Oprah, they're paying her. Why do you think she quit the Weight Watchers board and I, then suddenly was like, hello, I'm done. I hope they pay her there by that Ozempic <laughs> you know who pharma is, because you know the way, needs a, you know who the needs way she's Ozempic. looking. You know who needs some Ozempic is Selena Gomez. Sure. I See what she's looking like. Mm. <laughs> that listen that Ozempic when I saw those pictures of Oprah I was just like where's that Ozempic how does one get into that clinical trial <laughs> for me it's not a clinical trial it's available now the people in this country who are on it you should listen to our show two weeks ago we had um, uh, we had doctors in here Dr. Uh, Fatima who we've had on Fatima mm, Patel she mm. was in here talking to us and she was explaining how it works and what it does. And, and we've had uh, endocrinologists who've uh, been on to talk about it. So we've, we've been on this train already. Mm, 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 and mm, I mm, do mm, know mm. people who are doing it. Mm. And they look, they look amazing. Mm. Who knows whether there are side effects. They may still well, be in the future. 20 years from now. 
but I will have had 20 years of being thin. And maybe <laughs> maybe being so thin is what uh, ultimately had it's going to save me from the aliens. Well, this is why the aliens will take me. It might not save you from what poor Kate, poor Kate Middleton's going through. She's always been thin. Uh, listen. There's a there's a fine line. But when you're thin, you, you, when you're thin, you take up less space in the alien ship. So, if they want you, <laughs> who says they're going to even come and get you and me? Uh, Mapello says you must please invite the citizen concerned lady to the burning platform to help you interview these politicians. Yeah, she's terrific. She was at one of our events mm, a couple I, of weeks I ago. I met her first time I met her as well. Oh, she's great, skin. huh? Guys, amazing skin. You see, now the personal always bleeds into the public and so on. Ah, 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 ah. She has great ah. skin. Listen, it, it's, it, I actually saw her from across the room and I, it takes me, I'm always in, in these rooms where people are famous and whatever, you have to, you have to hold yourself back. Yeah, but yeah you can't because behave like you don't a fan. Know, you, yeah. yeah, you don't know. Mm. But also it takes, for me, it takes me a minute to, to kind of figure out if I know you or if I know you from a screen somewhere or whatnot. So I yes. always like, you must always like hold yourself back. And I, I like wondered, who's that girl? And what, what is that skin? I wanted to ask her what was on her skin, but I didn't. I have lots to ask her that has nothing to do with her skin. It, it, but you should start with the skin, yo. I think we should get her on the show though. Yes, absolutely. So we have also been talking to her. Love she's got, her TikTok. She's got a very, yeah, very, very successful YouTube TikTok thing going. And, um, you know, we might be working with her again from a podcast party initiative uh, going forward. But we'll see. We've got to sit down and talk to her. But I want to get her on this show because I think people love her. And uh, Fire Monkey says, I remember the interview Juju had with Deborah Pat on Third Degree and she commented on him getting fat and he said it was the Heineken. But he called it the Hennekin. <laughs> I think Julius, as evidenced by the fact that he didn't know the price of bread, I think he's on to much more expensive stuff than beer. Listen, uh, Musi Maimane could not help himself from trolling Julius about that issue. He he got yeah, onto he trolled Julius about the the loaf of loaf of Sasko. bread versus loaf lo loaf loaf of fans. Sasko. Low oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Gucci, I, re I retweeted that. I liked it. I thought it was funny. Like, hi, guys. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Yeah, when, I, when you are in this, this public space, public sphere that these people are, are in, there, <laughs> there are some lines. There are some lines. There are some lines. And when I saw, there were a couple of things that, that Musi tweeted yesterday or the day before, which all of them made me think, ah, ah, Baba. Pull yourself. <laughs> yourself in. Back to yourself. Zitande. I, yeah. I did want to just like, I wanted to tweet Zitande. I think we must bring that back. I'm going to wear the t-shirt next So we need two t-shirts for me. Um, the, my Zitande t-shirt, I think I must wear it on the show more often when we're doing political. And I need to bring you a stop don't, don't. nonsense. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to say to, to, to Musi Zitande. <laughs> I did. Yesterday, I wanted to. But I did not. All right. Well, uh, today we'll do the good party as part of the burning platform. Um, are there any other news stories? Oh, the bridge, the bridge that collapsed in Baltimore. Well, it didn't collapse. A ship, a ship sailed right into the support of the bridge, right into the column underneath the bridge. 93,000 tons, I think they said, is what that thing weighs that went into the bridge. I saw 93,000 tons of steel. Now, I love ships because every time I see it, I'm like, how does that thing even float? Mm -hmm. How do you, how do they, mm -hmm. I, I love ships. You remember this when we went on the cruise. Absolutely love ships. But watching that, wow. Let me just play the video in case uh, you haven't seen it. This is unbelievable. In Baltimore, Maryland, huge container ship comes steaming along and and we'll play it says that was real it was real um so <laughs> it lost power it see lost it power yeah and and you can you can see the 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 bulk of this thing just moving then power it recovers comes back on. yeah there's a whole lot of smoke as the engines kick in then they lose power again and they recover again but now this means someone is at the controls, but now they're heading straight for the bridge and boom. 
Apparently, cars that were on the bridge went down. Oh, but apparently, only six people Jesus. were injured in this little... It's a hell of a thing to watch. It really is extraordinary. And you can see the shadow of the bridge on it now, and then one, two, three, boom. Smashes right in there. And that thing, it just... Like, it shows you there's always, it doesn't matter how, oh, how, how well engineered something is, there's always some human error. That sad piano music, which who knew we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to make it through the show without some sad piano music. So, do you have the video of the mayor? Because no. what we also then discovered is that the mayor of Baltimore is 20 years old. Oh. Well, he's not 20. But, when when he came on and he out that's the mayor. Democrats. <laughs> when know. he was good, I mean, he he <clears throat> he he was middle of the night, well, early morning or Hold whatever on. it was. Stop everything as if that isn't enough for you this morning. Uh, good morning. Here's Catherine from Centurion. <laughs> Hi, Catherine. Let's just make a special note. You know. <laughs> And you also need Hello, a Catherine. listen properly T-shirt. That's a good idea. Listen properly now. Yeah. Uh, Sandile makes a very good point that the chief socialist, being Julius Malema, doesn't know that bread is zero rated. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That ship swerved and then went straight into the support mm. beam. Well, it was too late, you see. Uh. So Patrick here is giving the physics mm. around uh, why ships don't sink. It's... Listen, yo, I have read what there is to read. I l love everything about the physics of what keeps all that hunk of metal floating. Amazing. Uh, there were construction workers on the bridge, less traffic on it at the mm. time, still a loss of life. Oh, that's mm. horrible. Mm. But, I mean, this is, again, in the world's great superpower. Funny, I was listening to a, uh, a news report the other day. Shame. Yeah. We're, we're all witnessing the, the worst throes of uh, a nation in decline. Gore Vidal predicted this years ago, but it's happening. It's happening before our very eyes. Um, I heard this news report that they linked to, you know how many, how many dead malls there are in America? You know what a dead mall is? That's a mall, a shopping mall that just nobody goes to anymore. They shut them down. They still switch on the power uh, to keep it clean. They belong to somebody, but it's more expensive to dismantle the mall than it is to just keep it open. Um, so what happened, they use these malls. Guess who uses them? Old people to walk, safer than being in the street. So they take busloads of old people into these dead shopping malls in America and they walk through the mall. That is. That's where they get their exercise. That is just so sad, right? Dystopian. That is disturbing. When you watch the uh, zombie apocalypse movies and all these visions of a terrible future, it's always, empty shopping malls and we have a lot of those happening here you know all those strip malls we 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 are over traded with malls there lots of empty shops with like paper in everywhere everywhere but here we're that's gonna, but here that's also because we're not growing economically the and, and because we probably built too many of them but in america they also have that problem it is much more related to the fact that america is just not making the, more, the, 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 the money that they used to make. Mm. And apparently, if you count the number of parking spaces in America, there are eight times more parking spaces in America than there are cars. And that's why all those parking lots are overrun with weeds, cracking asphalt. And Wait, it's eight times eight more, times parking, more sp parking spaces in America because mostly at shopping malls. Um, Does that mean they don't have to do that thing where you're like driving slowly trying to find parking uh, and can, there's a small car parked right in the front? You think it's a parking space? Like, yeah. People do that anyway because they want to be closer to the doors. But in America, there are eight times more parking spaces than there are cars. Cars across the whole country. That's a lot of parking spaces. So mm. at least they're using them for old people to walk around. Amazon is going to destroy malls in South Africa, says Christian. I think he may have a point. 
They do online shopping in America now. That's also true. Mm. But the economy in America is in decline. It's not great at the moment. And Americans are the first to tell you that. Uh, I worked on a cruise ship and we had to go into dry dock and I couldn't believe the bottom could fit in my fingers. It looks crazy out of the water. <laughs> it does. Unbelievable. And just Milan says there was an article not too long back that said Four Ways, has, Four Ways Mall has an entire vacant wing. Did you know this? What? Four Ways Mall. I did not know that. Just Milan. Wow. They have a whole boarded off section that no one goes into. Hmm. Weird. Do you think spaces. it's got rats, that boarded off section? As big as cats. Yeah, because you know the Hyatt, my office is near the Hyatt here in mm. Rosebank, and the Hyatt That's is been still closed, closed. for a bit barbed wire in the front. Barbed what, wire what happened in the front. There? And when, you, when you're in the, the, when you come in through the side where um, the grill house is and whatnot, you can actually smell the hotel, the empty hotel mm. coming. And it's like, I, I don't know what's going on there. I don't know. It closed down because of COVID, when it was COVID, and then it just never, never reopened. reopened. And every time I drive past it, I think this is great site, great building, great. Why is this thing still closed? And then it freaks me out because then I think about the rats. And now that we've been talking about frogging. Yeah, it makes me nervous. One last quick thing, um, and then we've got to get to the burning platform. Uh, Canton will be in this morning as well as He's there Brett in Heron. the window. Look I at know, him. You were waving at him already. People were going, who's he waving at? Well, it's Canton Bule. Canton Bule. Come on in, Canton. This is your uh, Mikasa Sukasa. Make yourself comfortable. Um, just one quick thing about malls. You know where the biggest mall in the world is? The biggest shopping mall in the world? No. Iran. No ways. Yeah, Tehran. Biggest shopping mall in the world. Look at look it up. Contradict me if you think you can. <laughs> we will be back in just a moment or two. And we've got the burning platform, which I know you're ready for. God, this hour has just been like a schizophrenic a lot like the first snapshot quarter of the world of this year. Oh my God. Oh, there's more this to come. week on the Auto Trader Podcast. In your experience. These systems have always been a hit and a miss with me. Sometimes they work yeah. really well. On Mercedes TV. one's pretty good. Oh, Mercedes nice. one's good. Uh, the BMW one is is pretty good. Even yeah. the, the Cherry one's pretty good. And that extends yeah. obviously to Omoda and Jaku as well. The same, they're the same system. But I spent two weeks in Sydney recently in Australia and they are like they have cameras everywhere to pick yeah. up whether you are touching your cell phone while driving. Oh, really? Okay. So I found the Siri function on Apple CarPlay driving my brother-in-law's uh, new BMW X1. I found that super, super handy because I would just say, um, I don't want to say it now in case someone's phone goes off. I would, <laughs> I would prompt the voice command yeah. system on Apple <laughs> yeah. and I would ask it to take us to a specific place or to play a specific song or yeah. to just do something for me. And I found that very useful because I was trying to obviously obey the law and avoid the fines. They find yeah. you for everything in Australia. Catch us every Monday at 9am on YouTube and on autotrader.co.za.
morning. Thursdays are our day for the burning platform, and today is no different. We will be talking politics as we do on a Thursday, and we've been speaking to party leaders from all the various parties. And uh, one of the parties, Pumi and I saw the posters in Cape Town the other day with Auntie Pat on them, and today we are talking to the good party. Canton, how are you? I'm fabulous, and uh, I was... Really yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me just shut him down there. There we go. No, no, no. I got you. I got you now. Go on. Uh -huh. There. You were saying? So the interesting thing about the Baltimore ship yeah. is that there are already conspiracy theories going around it. Of course there are. It takes five seconds for a conspiracy theory to come so up. What except, are they? Except this one comes from our fellow South African, from Lara Logan. Yeah? And <laughs> according to her intel sources, this was a cyber attack that shut down the ship's engines, and it was actually timed to take out the bridge. What do you think the probability of this particular conspiracy theory being true? Look, uh, Lara Logan's kind of interesting because I think that 80% of the time her sources are accurate. Hmm. I don't know whether this is part of the 20%. <laughs> <laughs> but cyber attack by whom? Hmm. Aha. Now, who has the technological Cause... capability to interfere in American elections <laughs> and take hmm. on bridges? Hey, when I... But Putin Lava, on the roots. Lava, Russia, Lava, Russia, Lava, Russia. Lava, Lava, they've got Lava, Lava, They've got terrorists in their cities. They've got their own. Guy. I'm Just trying them. not to swear. We don't call Russia. them. We don't welcome. call them terrorists. Russia, Russia, Russia. 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 Yeah. That's all I'm going to say. All right, Thank let's you. welcome Brett. Uh, Brett Heron is, of course, with the Good Party, and it is a pleasure to have him here in studio. The last time we spoke to you was online. He's the Secretary General of Good. And how are things going with good at the moment? Tell us, uh, give us a little update before we start uh, asking you about policies and elections and what you guys are planning and where you're going to be and uh, Auntie Pat and Peter de Villiers and a whole wow. lot of other stuff. <laughs> oh, we've got to ask Raise you yourself. We've got an hour. We've I'm got ready. A, we've got a lot to talk to you about, yeah. but tell us how things are going. I think things are going well. Um, we had our first national elective conference in November. Um, we elected our leadership. We um, adopted policies. Um, we amended our constitution to make provision for engaging with parties after the election if needed. So um, we things are going well. Um, we prepared. We've been prepared. We're more prepared for this election than we were for the previous two, um, and that's obvious given that we were we're only five years old. So you would get more prepared. So I think we're doing well. But Brett, every party that's been in here has given us wildly optimistic figures for what they're expecting in this election. I mean, uh, Kenneth Meshwe was saying 10% <laughs> of the national vote is going to the ACDP. You, 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 you're nodding in a, in a, in a derogatory fashion. You're, 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 you know, you're looking like most of us in disbelief at these numbers. Uh, Bantu Holomisa says he's going to get great numbers. But someone's got to lose when everybody says they're going up. Uh, and the good party, obviously, you've you've had uh, a little more profile with one of uh, our ministries being essentially given to uh, Patricia DeLille. So she's had a lot more national prominence, maybe, than many of the other politicians. But do you think that your numbers are going to go up? Yes, I think they're going to go up, but I'm not predicting 10% or 20% or <laughs> that we, reasonable. and you'll see that our manifesto doesn't suggest that we're going to be in government or be the government. Um, I mean, we're realistic. We a young party. We're growing, and we would like. We grew from 2019 to 2021, and we would like to grow in 2024. Um, we occupy an interesting space in the political spectrum. Um, we don't have a populist message, um, and we are offering a reasonable response to South Africa's challenges um, in a progressive political space, um, and we'll grow. Um, but okay. I'm not going to sit here and say we're getting going to get 10%. No, I think that's a smart Wh answer. Why do you think you will grow when there are so many more parties that are playing in the space that you have traditionally kind of been the only ones in? I think we're going to grow, I mean, first of all, because we're more organized and uh, politics is not, um, the results for, for, for political contestation is not achieved by looking at social media. It's what you're doing on the ground, working in communities, and we've been doing that. Um, and um, although by-election results are not the only thing to go by, um, we've seen some, we've seen growth in every by-election we've contested except um, two. Um, and we've contested in about almost 20 over the last two years. So I think that there's a, there is growing support for us in an environment where there's declining support for the old parties who have mm. been in government 
and have created the environment in which people are suffering. Well, I'm going to address the elephant in the room because Gaten McKenzie is not an old party and he's been on here. And he's been very vocal about the fact that he believes that at their core, his party are a colored people's party. Um, he said that's the vote that he's going for unashamedly. And any you know additional help they get from other people is fine, but that's who he's going for. Is that not a threat as it might be for the DA in the Western Cape to good? Are Gayton McKenzie and the Patriotic Alliance not meant to be the people chiefly in your target? I, I don't think so. I think that assumes that colored people are homogeneous and that they're all going to support the same thing. Um, our policies, our approach to politics is wildly different to Gayton McKenzie and the Patriotic Alliance. Um, and where we've contested with them, um, they have beaten us in some elections and we've beaten them in others. Um, and so I think we mustn't view the colored community as one community that will that has been captured or consumed by by patriotic alliance. Yes, I completely agree with you. And sir. we um we are appealing to rational, reasonable people who would like to see South Africa progress um and who believe in human rights. And um and so I think we have a different constituency. Okay. I think that's a fair comment, but yeah. I think one of the questions that then comes to mind. If we're looking at the fact that we don't consider colored people to be homogenous, the single issue right now that I think that's dividing that particular community is the Israel-Palestine conflict, and it's very you, clear. You don't you don't go in with soft questions, no, I can't. No, soft question. And then it, it's very clear that I mean we've got two uh, two million Muslims in South Africa, and most of them happen to be um, colored people in the Western Cape, and they're very clearly, very firmly on the side of um, uh, the Palestinians in this particular conflict. So where does your party stand on that particular thing? And more importantly, how do you then negotiate that very obvious divide, given that that's your strongest base? Well, I mean, we've been um, supporters of sovereignty for Palestine since we were formed. And we've been involved in um, protests and championing that cause since 2019. We, in 2020, we had a billboard up here in Johannesburg saying justice for Palestine. So, I mean, our um, support for the people of Palestine and for their sovereignty and the right to occupy their own land um, predates the 7th of October. So is that is differentiated between you guys and Gates? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've, we, we are firmly um, in support of justice for Palestine um, and um, we supported the government's um, uh, approach to the ICJ. In fact, I think that my question to the Minister Durko actually prompted the um, the application to the ICJ because I, I submitted a question to her saying, we've got this genocide convention. Has South Africa thought of using it? And then six weeks later, we were so announced. So you gave her the idea. I, I, I can't. I can't say it, but I mean, I, I did ask a question when it wasn't being mentioned publicly. And how's that gone for us, huh? Well, I think it's um, it's it was the right thing to do. I mean, obviously, it's it has has its own provocations, um, but it um, it was the right thing to do. And sometimes you have to do the right thing, even if it's hard. All right. So, uh, Patricia, because uh, she always comes up, can uh, the guest? This is from one of our listeners. Please explain why your leader is in the cabinet, propping the ANC up, and has been in a million parties since '94. Well, I don't think she's been in a million parties since 1994. Uh, we do have 115 on the ballot, but she hasn't been in all of those. Um, and I think the, you know... The, Has she even been in a majority of those? Yeah, I mean, she's she started her own party, um, well, they started the ID, and um, that merger into the DA was part of a an attempt to realign the opposition. It was based on some values um, that were agreed before the merger had took place. Um, the DA were not able to live up to those values, and so many of us exited, including me. Mm. Um, but um, you don't know, worry; the, the DA has a steady flow of people out. Yes, and uh, for good reason. <laughs> um, but I, you know, this question around the cabinet is really strange because it's if South Africa has amnesia. Uh, we've had an opposition leader in the cabinet in every cabinet since 1994. Uh, we had um, Chief Butelezi. Butelezi. Yeah. He was in two cabinets. Martinez van Skalkweg. Remember Martinez. Him? Gordbrook. 
we had um, the, the leader of the Freedom Front Plus in Zuma's cabinet. Right. So what I don't understand why people forgotten that other leaders have been in the cabinet. But and they, that's and they haven't been and that doesn't mean that those parties have been captured. Maybe it's because there's a special category with Patricia. And and I'll give her credit, and I always do, that she was the one who lifted the lid on the arms deal. She developed a reputation for being a no-nonsense politician in the beginning who couldn't be swayed this way or the other by bribes and treachery and manipulation the way that politicians are used to working in this country. And maybe because she had that unbelievable and unassailable reputation before, many people found it disappointing that she'd come into government. Now, how's she been performing, in your opinion, as a minister? Because that's a whole separate thing. You know, once you get given the job for good or for bad, they then are there to prove something. And do you think Patricia DeLille has proven to be a good minister? Well, there was the border fence. Yeah, there was. There was the border so, fence. Yeah, look. Which Gaten has turned into his issue as well. Uh -huh. Right? I think that she's been an outstanding minister. And I don't say that only because I'm in the same party as her. But I mean, by the minister, the, the president's own monitoring and evaluation of his ministers, he, he monitors all of them. Um, she got 91% and a rating of exceptional, which means she delivered on most of her KPIs that she agreed to deliver on. She was sent to public works and infrastructure to clean up was probably the most corrupt department in, in government. Um, and she did a good job. She put in place, she gazetted rates so that um, South Africa's um, property, uh, our, our rental of properties couldn't be overcharged. She uh, gazetted rates for construction industry. She's really cleaned up and closed closed the loopholes for um, for corrupt activities to take place. She brought the SIU in to find the crooked people within the department. Uh, this bait bridge thing is is a half baked story because actually, as soon as she became aware that this fence was a problem, she again appointed the SIU. The, the officials who awarded the tender were suspended without pay, and. Um, the, the department went to court and got the profits that were made by the tenderer or the contractor repaid to the taxpayer. So those values and those things that South Africans saw in her, she took into government. And the same thing happened when she moved to tourism. Within two weeks, she cancelled that Tottenham Hotspurs deal. Mm. Uh, one billion rand she saved to the Which people canceled, of Africa. you thought might have been a good one, as I recall. You didn't. Someone, <laughs> someone said to me that, it, I'm sure it was you. Most certainly. <laughs> Whenever there's a controversial and wild opinion, I immediately attribute it to Cameron. All right, but Brett, I mean, look, people are saying here, um, of course you're going to say that because uh, she's uh, she's your, your party leader. JP says, oh, sure, let's just trust Cyril's judgment. <laughs> well, Do you think that you have the unfortunate problem that the DA has in that people have a higher standard in their minds for what you need to achieve? as opposed to like the ANC where, frankly, if they wake up in the morning, people are like, well done, that's terrific. With the, with the DA, with Good, perhaps with some of the other parties, they've, they've kind of set themselves up as being better than, and therefore they're judged by a different set of standards. That's a difficult question to answer. I think that we are, as opposition parties, expected to meet a different standard um, as opposed to the ANC. Um, and there's often a, um, an expectation that, that we can actually do a lot, um, whereas, in fact, we have to fight a lot. And when the ANC's got an outright majority in parliament, they can still get away with shielding the speaker, shielding whoever. Um, and so our voices need to be heard continuously, and people need to support those voices if they really want things to change. Um, so we, do, we are held to a higher standard, and I think... Certainly, I, speaking for good, I think we, tr we, we really strive to meet that standard. We take being elected as a privilege, and with that privilege comes huge responsibility. And that responsibility means um, honoring the, the commitments we made to voters when, when they voted for us. Well, you know, you, you Antipat, essentially, has a history with the DA and, in, in some ways, coalitions. And everybody is talking about how this next election is going to really be made in the coalition space. So how are you as good thinking about coalitions given your bad experience with the DA? So our, um, we were in coalition when we were the independent Democrats, those of us who were in the ind independent Democrats with the DA in the city of Cape Town. Uh, that led to a merger of the two parties where the ID joined the DA. So that wasn't really a coalition. Um, 
maybe a, a, a sort of broad church coalition within one party. But we adopted at our conference in November a policy that will guide us on coalitions. So we're not talking about coalitions pre-elections. We'll talk about them afterwards, and we will consider whether we where we are needed to form a government, whether we should support or enter into a coalition. We're not opposed to it, um, but we um, we at this point we are unaligned. We haven't said we won't work with this party and we won't work with that party. Um, we will negotiate coalition agreements post the elections. Is there someone you won't work with? Won't work with. We haven't said that there's a party we won't work with. We have um, our policy that we adopted really says these are the four justices that we that we built our foundations and our policies on: spatial justice, social justice, economic justice, and environmental justice. That informs our manifesto and our policies, and where we can find agreement on the implementation on some of those things, because coalitions are, are comp compromised, then we will work with those parties. So maybe let's talk a little bit about your policies and what your most important policies are going into 2024. I think if you look at our manifesto and even going back about 18 months, you will see that we have focused extensively on the lived reality of the majority of South Africans and the fact that they are suffering um, living in poverty. 55% of South Africans live in poverty. Um, and um, our most perhaps, perhaps important, um, the, the most important aspects of our, of our policies and our manifesto are to address the socioeconomic rights of South Africans. Mm. Um, and that starts with saying we have high, high, high and entrenched poverty, we have high unemployment and we have low economic growth. And what we need to do is address the, the, the poverty straight away, immediately. with a how, how do you do that? With a basic income grant. That from is, where? Uh, from from our, our bounty. So where do you, what do you cut back on in order to pay that basic income grant? So we, we I mean, this is just not, this is not thumbs up. We, we appointed economists to go and do the research for us. And in fact, we didn't need to do that because 20 years ago, the government commissioned their own own investigation into a basic income grant, and it was we found to be feasible. Already, we're looking at, what, 20-odd million. It keeps going up every week, uh, people who are on social grants at the moment. And, and we know this is unsustainable. You want to add another layer of money to this and give a basic income grant to people as well. Uh, I, I think Canton's point is like, where is this money going to come from? There's no economist who can manufacture magic. So the um the starting point is not whether we um should do it it's it's what are the consequences of not doing it okay but where do we, but where no, do we no, get no, it from it, maybe so if you allow me to speak uh, no no, no. Um, i'm in agreement with what you're saying mm. but the question is where does the money come from the we need about 110 billion rand to pay the about 10 million people who will be unemployed who are unemployed and will be unemployed even if we achieve 3% economic growth over the next 15 years. We will remain at about 8 to 9 to 10 million people unemployed. They will not find work, even if we triple our economic growth. We have um, a budget of 2.37 trillion, and we're looking for 110 billion rand. If you start with allocative efficiencies, you look at what Tito and Boweni promised to do three years ago. Let's go zero-based budgeting and say, the most important thing in order for South Africans or any human being to survive is water and food we must provide at least the basics for people to meet that need. That goes in first in the budget. And then you build all around it. You can also say, we've got a whole lot of the poverty alleviation programs running in the country. Let's test all of those for impact versus paying people a thousand rand per month as a basic income grant. And you'll find that the cash transfer is probably more imp impactful than all of these poverty alleviation programs. So it starts with allocative efficiency. There's also, Obviously, the the clamping down on corruption and no, wasted. You know, I'd like to. That sounds like a lot of corporate speak that you're giving. But my my basic thing is, we have a fixed pool of money in order for us to pay this grant. And I'm taking the view with you that yes, you do need to make poverty alleviation something that's at the top of the food chain. Where do you take the money from? What do you cut back on? Because just simply saying that we allocate things more efficiently, that fundamentally means you cut back on something. What are the areas that we cut back on to get this 
110 billion rand. Well, we cut back on wastage. We cut back on programs that are duplicated amongst um, departments. We cut back on the amount of money being spent on provincial executives and provincial legislatures, which is in itself, the salaries just of MPLs is 4 billion rand a year. Um, we cut back on um, the number of ministries and departments. So then we go into the budget and say, uh, we've got this employment tax incentive. Um, is it really working? Is it, creating un uh, is it creating employment for young people? It's giving companies a tax incentive, so reducing tax income, um, but not really producing results. Um, we look at um, um, reforming tax deductions for wealthy South Africans. Um, we, the, the, well, a well, very small percentage of South Africans can contribute 350,000 rand a year towards retirement annuities, um, but they get tax breaks if they can. And so you have to start cobbling this money together from really looking at the budget and at some tax reforms. Um, and it can be achieved. Well, I mean, optimistically, sure. You know, lots can be achieved. In I'm just doing a quick calculation. So 110 kind of billion rand um, uh, spread among 55 million people works out to 2,000 rand a year. So what are you trying to say? That's an extra 2,000 rand a year that... No, what I'm we saying is 2,000 rand a year divided by um, by 12 months. So what sort of um, impact is that meant to be actually making? Well, it's a very small impact. Yeah, it's 186 rand a month. And it's a very small impact. I mean, there there are, the thing is about the basic income grant is first finding the political will to do it. If you find the political will to do it, you can find the funding to do it. And we the funding is in the budget. It's about cutting back on programs that are wasteful, that are not having impact. But this is basically a road to disaster that's happened in, in so many places. No, we have everyone looks at Norway as an example, and they say Norway actually pays people who are not. But that's because they've got a, a sovereign. Because they've got a sovereign <laughs> wealth fund, exactly. Because they've actually grown the economy first. Now, you see, a lot of what I'm hearing you say, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, clearly. It's talking about stuff that's even more extractive than what we've got right now. Nothing is actually addressing how we grow the economy so that we have a bigger pool that we can then allocate resources more fairly. I mean, for example, what's your stance in terms of minimum wage, where we pricing um, the minimum wage at thousands of rands, so we're making it illegal for people to work for a thousand rand a month, but we want to give them grants of 186 rand a month. To my mind, that's unconscionable. In fact, it's fundamentally immoral. So where's your stance on the minimum wage, as an example? Our labor laws have been consistently targeted by many people around the world as an obstacle to economic growth. What about broad-based black economic empowerment? Again, it's another thing that that uh, holds us back. So, well, let yeah, him answer. Yeah. I think I think you're, I think you're making some generalizations. Um, I, I mean, I don't know. I, 186 rand per month is, I don't know where that comes from. That's how you well, work. Well, it's, it's 110 billion uh, yeah, rand but it's, divided by 55 million people, which gives you 2,000 rand a year divided no, but, no, by but, 12. No, Catherine, yeah, but you're, you're talking about you're universal basic anything. income. <laughs> they, they will decide. The good party will decide who deserves that. The, 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 the policy we're presenting is all so be for the you. 10 million or the 8 or 9, 10 million They'll take your unemployed. money, but they won't, they won't No, we definitely will take it, it and, we'll re and we will redistribute it. But, so I mean, this is, this but is you've true. asked me right. like three or four questions at once. Yeah, give you've, him you've a asked, chance to answer. I mean, we, I, was, I was addressing the poverty part, but sure. I, it did indicate we have a low economic growth crisis. So we have to address the low economic growth crisis. We cannot accept that it's ac normal, acceptable for the Minister of Finance to stand up and say we're going to have a 1% economic growth over the medium term and not present a coherent plan to actually change that to at least 5% economic growth, which will meaningfully create employment and then reduce the number of people in poverty and reduce the number of people who qual would qualify for the basic income grant. Because we're ring, ring fencing the basic income grant for unemployed adults between the ages of 18 and 60 who don't qualify for any other social support, of which there are about eight or nine million of them currently. Um, on... Um, you know, the, the generalization that black economic empowerment or triple B, double E has held us back. I don't, uh, there's no evidence that it's held us back. Oh, there's definitely no really? evidence. No, Wait. there's no evidence for Wait. it at all. And we also have to, we have to redress our economy. We can't, um, we can't um, not, act, not as, a, as a state be active 
in encouraging uh, the econ economic transformation in our country. And the tool to do that currently is triple B, double E. It's not a perfect tool. It's definitely not a perfect tool, but show nobody, me, show me how it nobody works. has come. Show me where it is. Nobody has come up with a better tool. Um, so how do we redistribute or encourage companies to ensure that those who were excluded previously um, are included in this economy? And the triple B double E basically says, if you want to do government with the state, a business with the state, you need to have a certain level of triple B, double E status. Right, so you're, and you can achieve it in you're various pro, you're ways. You're pro that. Let's leave that alone. So you're not going to change the minimum wage. You're not going to change no. this. Um, and you want to extract more money from taxpayers to give to people who are not taxpayers. I'm just putting it all in like black and white. Look, put blunt, bluntly, yes, we want okay. the fiscus to fund um, the ability for the people fiscus, to live. People, people, the people who pay the fiscus, tax. The people who pay tax. Okay, right. the people who pay tax create the fiscus. Um, and the fiscus belongs to all of us. And we want, we don't want 9 million people to starve to death. And it's uh, incumbent on everyone else because pa not Patrick Virus is here in the comments. Do you have any benefits planned for all these people who you're going to be charging more tax money? Benefits. Benefits for them. Yeah. Are there I any reasons for them to keep paying their tax and being a good taxpayer? Like, or should they start thinking about moving their money away? Yeah, look, or, I mean, or being I, dishonest. I guess we're appealing to um, a higher order of, of, of consciousness about uh, we're all in this together. But you don't ask and for we, that higher order of consciousness from people who are going to get this basic income grant. They must just carry on taking from the state. But that, are you, are you assuming that the fact that they're unemployed is their fault? No, but perhaps this will encourage more people to be unemployed. <laughs> no, I don't. I mean, a thousand rand a month. Can't, poss can't possibly can't can't possibly encourage more people to, to stay out of work when the minimum wage is is what three and a half thousand rand per month. So, I mean, you 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 talk, you you would be talking about people who are lunatics, really, to say I'm going to sit at home for a thousand rand a month when I've been offered this job. It doesn't make sense. And in fact, actually, pilot projects have shown that paying cash transfers as a basic income grant, fundamentally changes the employment status of, of, of those recipients. The pilot projects have been done in Namibia and Kenya, close to home. We don't have to use Norway as an example. Um, and the economy in those communities where the basic, a basic income grant has been paid to those recipients, people have found employment or created their own employment. And small and, and entrepreneurship is a huge problem in South Africa. We have low entrepreneurship. We need to be encouraging more. In fact, the good party, we testing, doing our own pilot project. We've taken a thousand rand, which is more or less what we're saying people should receive. Mm -hmm. We've given it to unemployed people and said, how would you start a micro a micro enterprise? And and people are doing that. We've got about 50 or 60 people in three provinces currently who were seed funded by the good party with a thousand rand who are now micro traders making a living for their family. So this is not, a, this is not, I don't think we should be saying what is the benefit for us. The benefit for all of us, those of us who have means, um, is that we have a socially sustainable country where people are not starving. So you just have. So to, we're currently yeah. having we're, we're currently having a a conversation that is pretty uh, intellectual about many parts of what's going wrong and could get better in our country. But we're also, when you're talking to voters, you're also talking on average to somebody that is 26, 27 years old uh, with a very low level of education because when we look at what it looks like, our matric pass rates and people who finish school. So how do you think as good you are translating all of this so that it appeals to what we know is the most important part of the of the electorate currently? Well, the most, if, if the most important part of the electorate is young people who are disillusioned because they're unemployed, because they have low or, or inadequate education, and also because we have a, an economy that's not creating jobs, that's the reality. Um, because Whose fault is that, by the way? In we'll your opinion? Let him answer no, that I question I want to know. First. I want to know about like where this bad economy comes from, because we have to ascribe this to somebody. Well, I don't, I, I mean, as I said in Parliament, um, our, our government, the ANC government, would like to blame um, the 2008 financial crisis. But 2008 <laughs> is 16 years ago. And 
Uh, most countries have recovered. And in Zimbabwe Africa, Zimbabwe has had better economic well, growth over yeah, that period. So I'm I'm making the same point <laughs> that in Africa the average economic growth is currently five to six percent. Um, Twenty-two countries in this financial year will achieve five to six percent economic growth in Africa, and South Africa is reducing the average in Southern Africa. So how come? Because we, we have, have a because we have broad because we don't economic we, no because we don't have the basics for growth in place. We don't have um, we we have an unstable electricity supply. We don't have logistics transport. Uh, and, logist and, and whose fault is all of that? It is the failure of the state. Right. And you want to give the state more control, more power. Uh, in what way? Well, I mean, in terms of, for example, basic income grants and growth of the I want to I want to give the state the duty that they already have in terms of the constitution to make sure that nobody lives and or wakes up every single day with zero income expected to live in a country where you need money to buy things do you need money to buy food basic food the basic in the, the food poverty line is 760 rand per month that's what an adult needs to meet their basic food requirements and we have nine or eight eight or nine million people who are currently waking up to 350 rand per month which yay for them it goes up to 370 rand per month on the first of april yeah. but i want to live in a country where those nine people nine million people are not starving you know, in in Nyanga in, in, in Cape Town, I met, I met a young man, 27 years old, unemployed, never had a job. And when I asked him how he was surviving, he very um, shyly or embarrassingly said, he slaughters cats. He finds a cat that's wandering by, he slaughters it and boils it in this Rick coffee can um, to eat. We know that there was a woman in Eastern Cape just a few months ago who killed herself, her three children, and then herself because she was unable to feed them. And the irony is that it was the debt collector who found her family all dead. We know that in KwaZulu-Natal, children are eating sand in order to fill their stomachs. That's not the country that I would like to live in. And we can find the resources to make sure that those people can at least feed themselves. Okay. So I'm going to remind you of my question yes. because I never did get <laughs> an answer get to my question. No, I, At I least you answered the question understand. about food, which Julius couldn't about loaf bread, right? From, <laughs> so well done on that front. So how do you make your message appealing to young people? The message, if, if young people, I mean, we, look, we have to reach young people and young people are disillusioned and rightfully so. Um, but our message is directed at them. They, they are the ones um, who make up the bulk of unemployed people in South Africa. They are the ones who um, have been let down by the education system, which doesn't um, uh, prepare them for work. And of course, they're the ones that are living in, an, in a country where the economy is not generating jobs, while many of us already have entrenched jobs. And we're not saying like Herman Mashaba that you must stay and work until you die. Um, so, I mean, but the point is, they wake up to this reality that we are trying to address which is that they have they wake up with no income they not, they don't qualify for a grant um or social service uh, so, social security because they're 26 years old so they're outside of the category um and so we're saying to them we will help you you will be provided with the minimum requirements that you need in order to survive at a thousand rand per month you can meet your food requirement you can buy some data for your phones, you can make applications for jobs, and you can occasionally buy a bus or train ticket to go and look for work or go for an interview. So providing that income is an opportunity for them to find some mobility in this economy um, or to find, if they're entrepreneurial, to start some micro um, trading enterprise. And so I think our message is appealing to young people because it addresses directly their everyday reality. We spoke earlier about seeing your posters in the Western Cape, in Cape Town specifically. And I think you've got two seats in Parliament. Yes. You've got two seats in Parliament. So you're largely a regional party. You know, you're in the Western Cape. You're very strong there. That's also where your voter base has been. Do you think that your message can carry into the rest of the country or should you be concentrating your efforts in the region? So most of our votes in the last two elections did come from the Western Cape, but we managed um, in the last election to get two council seats in the Northern Cape, two in Gauteng, and two in the Eastern Cape. So there is some growth in other provinces, um, and we are hoping to get um, seats in in those other provinces. 
Um, the message that we um, are sharing with South Africans is universal to South Africa. It's not confined to the Western Cape. Um, the, the reason you saw our posters up in, in the Western Cape, but you haven't yet seen them up in, in um, Gauteng or anywhere else, is because in the Western Cape, we already had the backing boards, the hard boards. And That's expensive. And it's very expensive. Yeah. And so for the rest of the country, we, and, I mean, we're printing you, corex. And, and you know, reasonably, you can't be everywhere. You can't campaign everywhere. Uh, there are some parties that just cannot do that. Oh, there are even large parties that have decided to forego campaigning in certain areas. Um, you know, I do want to move away from the economic stuff, but I do notice you said the four justices, social justice, economic justice, spatial justice, we have to still talk about, and environmental justice. But this is the kind of language that is like 10 years old already in America and has not delivered the voters that it was intended to. A lot of this stuff, social justice in particular, if it's justice, it doesn't need the social in front of it. What does that mean to you? And 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 is it is this just like the leftist stuff we've seen in America that's failed so dismally, or is it different? Well, it's not um, language for the sake of language. It helps us to position ourselves and to develop policies. So we test our policies against these justices. But really, they are all interrelated. I mean, they're, there's they. You, I think you're correct. They all. They're all about creating a just society. And in that just society, you have to address um, challenges that are like economic exclusion. So in the economic justice space, we'll address economic exclusion. So it helps us translate a just society. So you're not using it as a, a prefix to justice to give it a different meaning. You're just saying these are the categories in which we'd like to see more of that. And it guides how we exp how we develop policy. Because so social justice has come to mean very very different things to justice in a society. Yeah, social justice in the South African society mm -hmm. is about redressing and addressing our historic legacy, largely. So then it is the same as social justice in America? It's To some extent, it's, it's, there, there are similarities. I mean, so the United States has similar dis discriminatory history, um, but social justice in South Africa is more because it, is, it includes... Um, addressing poverty um, at a scale that no other country in the world almost has to address. So um, social justice, so and poverty, so poverty is both an economic justice issue, but also a social justice is issue. Yeah, I, I, I think what, that these, def how these much definitions of a cut in salaries yeah. do you think um, MPs should take? Cut in salaries? Yes, absolutely. I mean, they currently earn um, what is it? Um, what, what's the basic salary that you guys earn in Parliament? So well, the total cost to, <laughs> total cost of company to company or goes total cost of employment <laughs> is about one point two million. Right, but so the, the how, salary how, part how, is about six or seven hundred yeah, thousand. So, 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 how much of a cut should parliamentarians take? Because you know it's it's very clear that you know someone is uh, uh, you know it's leading by example. Surely, you know I'm, I'm of the view, for example, that a thirty five percent cut is actually good for all politicians because you know that's pretty much the percentage of the budget that goes to pay for public service so 35 percent cut would then eliminate public service no i think that it would substantially reduce the burden which could then go towards social grants don't you think yeah look i i don't have an issue of debating the the a cut in salaries to parliament i'm not I mean, it's, I, personally, I don't do this for for a salary. I do it because to my, some, to my point. So, 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 so I don't. I haven't. I haven't. I haven't put a figure on what um, parliamentarians should earn and whether they should their salary should be cut. Um, my concern around cutting salaries is you're going to reduce the quality of parliamentarians. Um, quite. I mean, I think the without disparaging anybody there there is a there's a relatively low level of 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 um quality in in parliament already i think the, the quality could be much better and maybe we'd have better outcomes so if you want to attract people who um are, are patriotic and want south africa to to succeed but who are also educated qualified or experienced and education doesn't have to be formal education any experience work experience is valuable um you, I think you have to pay them appropriately. Are you guys, to Pumi's earlier question, are you part of this multi-party charter? Do you not want to be a part of that? What do you think of the rest of the opposition? I mean, you did say that you're open to coalitions with anybody. 
Um, but what do you think of all of them? I mean, they're all talking big games and talking about big numbers. And we've had them in here professing that they're all going to sing Kumbaya after the election and then just decide which cabinet positions they want to apportion to who. Uh, you don't want to be a part of that conversation. No, we don't want to be part of it. I mean, it's obviously their right to to announce prior to an election that uh, these parties will work together to form a government if they could reach 50% plus one. Um, and But, um, you know, I mean, our approach to coalitions, as I said earlier, is to say, these are the, this is, this is what we've gone to voters and ask them to support. Um, and um, after the election, we would have had hopefully a few hundred thousand voters who supported us. Um, and we would have to honor that vote. We can't honor it by before the election saying we're going to partner with parties that don't share our values, don't share our policies, but we're just doing it because we want to be anti-ANC or keep get the ANC out because that's not going to be a sustainable um, coalition government afterwards. Mm -hmm. Happy Speaking with that. of sustainability, I've asked this question of other politicians who sat here in the same um, place as you. So Patricia DeLille has been part of our government from the jump, and she is still the leader of your party. What's your succession plan? The um, Our constitution says that um, our leader has to um, develop a succession plan. Um, she's obviously um, standing for re-election in, in this election. She was re-elected as our leader unopposed in November 2023. Um, and so over the next five years, um, I would say it is her duty to to work on a succession plan. Um, you are the only other person, aside from Peter de Villiers, who I know in the good party. I mean, I'm sure there are lots of other people who are noteworthy, but they haven't really made any noise <laughs> publicly. And maybe that's a good thing. Uh, Peter de Villiers, you guys have just uh, you've terminated his membership, <laughs> right? Because you got a, what, a bit handsy. Is that what handsy. happened? Is that the one we're using? I is don't that the know. Euphemism uh, these days? He got a bit handsy. There, uh, is that the euphemism these days? There are accusations of um, impropriety, sexual harassment, and so on. It's a serious thing. But you terminated his membership. Uh, is it easy to fill those spaces once you get rid of someone? And was he? Uh, did he kick and scream a lot when you said to him, "Hey, by the way, you're out." Look, I mean, it's not easy to terminate anyone's membership. Um, and we, a party that follows due process, so sometimes these processes take a frustratingly long time. But we, um, when we got the complaint on the 31st of January, we suspended him within hours. No, it was um, quick. And Give yourselves credit on that front. We, um, I mean, we walk the talk. We can't just talk about gender-based violence and not deliver we've, we've on it. We've got a speaker in the ruling party at the moment who uh, has, has got serious criminal allegations yeah brought against her and she's still sitting around on paid leave. Yeah. And, so, and that's the point I've been making around the speakers that the ANC has a duty really to resolve this. I mean, they have a constitution and rules and they must resolve it. But yes, we, we've, I mean, we do have a, a lot of talent in the, in the party and we, um, Peter was, t uh, his membership was terminated on Sunday and on Monday we had a new member of the provincial parliament sworn in. Her name is Suzette Little, and she has a lot of experience. She was a mayoral committee member in the city of Cape Town. Um, and she was a councillor, um, and she's someone whose voice I think you'll hear. Little for good. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of good for little, which is much worse. Canton, you've, uh, you've been sitting there quietly, which people are not used to. You know, it, it's kind of like we, we're, we're talking at entirely different all right, well, levels go out back here. to your and, level. Uh, You're saying, Pumi and I ask so stupid questions. Go on. Let's take your four justice pillars that we were talking about. And, but, you know, fundamentally, if you're going to take a look in terms of where jobs are going to come from. So let's say that we've managed to put aside the question of the basic uh, income grant and it's in place. How do we grow the economy? Where are the areas that you can see South Africa being a world leader, given all of the challenges that you've spoken about, even all of the disillusionment, how do we actually grow this economy? What are the specific areas that we can take a look at? Is it finance? Is it um, uh, technology? Is it uh, tourism? <laughs> Is it uh, um, paying uh, women to be surrogate mothers? What's the solution? 
you ask and you ask your questions a very interesting way because you almost answer <laughs> then start answering them before I get a chance to answer. Well, you go ahead. But I co-opt co -opt what he said I'll, and I'll, add I'll, some. Yeah, I'll cooperate <laughs> and co-opt. Um, the um, the as I said earlier, we have to get the basics for growth in place. So that is addressing all the challenges around electricity, logistics, um, I, the, the digital space, releasing spectrum. Um, and addressing water shortages. So we have an infrastructure problem in South Africa. So it starts with addressing our infrastructure problem. We have, for two reasons, first of all, there's a huge disparity in, in infrastructure across the country between communities. So there's a need to, to invest in so, infrastructure. So, Can so I, let's say we've done that. So we okay, invest, let's say we've done that. and let me Where just make the point, the point, the point is it's been done before investing in infrastructure to take a country out of a depression into success. Give, give us specific examples so, of infrastructure. So we must invest heavily in infrastructure. What type? We must in transportation infrastructure, so roads and um, um, rail, road and rail infrastructure must be, in, we must invest in that. We must invest in um, uh, what, what the, water infrastructure, the reticulation of water. We have to fix, obviously, we have to fix our electricity supply. Mm -hmm. um, we have to invest in, in um, ICT infrastructure, so the digital infrastructure. Those are the so basics for growth. Let me interrupt for a second because, once again, what we are talking about is all of the extractive stuff. What I want to know is, where does how do we the make the cake bigger? Yes, how do we make the cake bigger? Where does the economic Well, we're not going to make the cake bigger for as long as we don't have the infrastructure in place that but, will attract but and allow have, businesses. Once, once we, so let, once we, let's say we have a so once we have okay once we have that in place, then we have the green economy that we need to, we've been talking about the green economy since 2010, when President Zuma presented the one of the one of the many economic growth plans. In 2010, there was the green economy was 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 in this economic framework. Tell it us what the green economy means. The and, green and economy the is, is trans, transitioning from obviously fossil fuel to, um, to renewable sources of energy and producing the components in South Africa for um, for the green economy. So we've already, uh, so, I mean, we're importing solar panels, billions of rands worth of solar panels from what China. What components we can make them that go into a solar panel and do we have them available? Yet? I don't know what the components are that well, go into okay. a solar panel, why, but why, I know that, I know that we're importing the them. Why are you asking that? I'm, I'm asking why? that because this idea that we can manufacture the solar panels here is pie in the sky because we need rare earth elements that China has an abundance of and we don't have them. But we can assemble we can we can import the parts that we need. We can assemble. We have, we have already done it. We've already done that. We've already done this in Atlantis and Cape Town when we were when we were in the city of Cape Town. Um, when we were part of government in the city of Cape Town, we um, we provided special rates in an environment, an impoverished environment in Atlantis and Cape Town, and encouraged the green economy industry to go there. So we've got so components. We've got components. So it's a subsidy. It was a it was a rates based subsidy. Yes. And once again, it's extractive. It's not growing the economy. And even even really with fairness, Brett, even the green economy, right, is essentially doing something we don't need in order to create jobs that we also don't need. If we had already solved the energy problem with ESCOM, and let's say because we have cheap coal and we can burn that and create the energy that we need, energy does feed the economy. Once that's going, why would we want to supplement something that's already working with something that we're not sure will work because it could be hugely expensive and it might not be as generative of the power that we require? But we don't have enough generative power no, no, capacity. But, but remember, so we, we do need to supplement the, the generation capacity. That, and, 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 the quickest, people, and the quickest and cheapest way of doing that is probably to add renewables. And, and you're not wrong. Most people who can afford that have already done it and most businesses have already done so that's why you see solar panels up everywhere and it's a huge growing booming part of the economy but the reality is that that alone is not going to bring the jobs about that will that will alleviate this problem no, that we have the it's, basic it's, income growth. it's it's one component of of i mean you know, the question was, what are the industries that we need to support in order mm. to grow the economy? So green economy is one of them. Tourism is obviously the other. Um, the, the investment in infrastructure is an investment in the construction sector. Um, and um, investment in... Um, I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> That's okay. We, 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 
okay, we do hope you're you know, back. Having, we, it's, it's, okay, it's a lot of people. It's yeah. coming from, from every direction. But I would, we've got... But I'm sorry, I did want to make the point yeah. that um, part of gr growing the economy is investing in entrepreneurship. And the bar the barrier to growing our entrepreneurship is access to finance. But it, the barrier is also the government. It's an, well, it, it's well, the government, yes. The but I listen. I started a business uh, two, uh, twenty years ago. I can assure you, if you've got an entrepreneurial spirit, no red tape is going to stop you from starting a business. What stops you from starting a business is access to finance. I got access to finance because I'm a graduate. And when I went to Business Partners, which was the old small business development corporation, they said to me, we'll give you this loan. I had no collateral because we know that you're a qualified lawyer. And if you can't pay the, the loan back, we'll, you'll go back and practice law and, and you'll pay it back. So access to finance is the great barrier what to entrepreneurship. Your, what was your business, by the way? My business is legal skills training. Yeah, look, I, I think that's there, there are many other reasons but, why that access to finance was easily available yes, to of you. Course. But I don't no, want to I, talk I, about I'm aware that. of I'm I aware really, of that. I really want to talk I, I really would like you to forecast for us a little bit. based on on all of your 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 polling and your intel within your party what this election is gonna look like and what you're going to look like on the other side of it. <laughs> we started the conversation with Gareth. I'm saying accusing and being disparaging about parties who come in here who, who, who uh, give percentages. Not even, not even me. No, it's like it's it's, about, it's, it's, the no, audience yeah, are like, no. oh, wow, 10%. That's a little bit uh, grand. No, yeah. no, really. because I, and, and I'll tell no, you no. why. I really would like to hear because we are going to have this exercise post the election and see where the chips have fallen. But it's important to understand. I would like to understand where the mind of your party is at going into this election and what you think you're going to do after that. So we would like, as I said, we've, we're on a trajectory of growth and we would like to continue that growth. Um, and we don't mind being a small party that is growing, a small party that is uh, true to its values and true to its policies and, and knows who it is and growing. Um, so we currently, I mean, we started three months before the, the 2019 elections and we managed to get two seats. We were one of only two new parties that got seats in the National Assembly um, when there were about 14 or 15 on the ballot paper. So we would like to grow. If we can, if we can grow and, and get 10 members of parliament, we would be ecstatic. Um, so if we can go from two to four to six, that would show growth. Mm -hmm. We would like to increase the number of seats in the Western Cape Provincial Parliament. We got one. We got one with about 60,000 votes. Al Jamar got one with 17,000 votes. There's something seriously wrong with that formula. Yeah. But um, in any event, we we would like to grow to two or three, four members in the provincial parliament. We would like a seat in the Northern Cape, in Gauteng, and the Eastern Cape. Okay, that's interesting to know. What about Cape Exit? You know, there's still people who think this is a thing. So, <laughs> I don't think it's a thing. Um, and I, I mean, it's rooted in all kinds of... Um, uh, ideology that I find repulsive. Um, it's also an interesting. It's interesting to engage with people Why around. Why do you find it repulsive, by the because way? Because I mean, that's, that's quite a word to use in yeah, politics. Everybody tries to dumb but, things down, but that's quite a. Because it seems to be based, or it is a. It's based on this idea that first of all, the Western Cape is this utopia, and it's not for many people who live in the Western Cape, and that um, we have to keep the ANC out. And the, right now, the Western Cape is governed by the DA, so let's be a different country. Um, I, the DA is not calling for Cape Exit. How they flirt? They you you see that you, the thing about the DA? You I must mean, you must you must watch. Fair, they they flirt. Yeah. This Western Cape Powers Bill is an attempt to kind of appease some of them. They allow some of their members to flirt with with really strange that's, things. That's fair, but then, in social but media then, space because they create confusion that they are maybe inclined to be Cape Exit, okay. but so not but really. Let's not but let's, but let's not go there. Why so, is it repulsive? So I've told you why it's, I think it's repulsive. But the thing is about um, um, state independence universally across, across the, the world is that there has to be a historic reason for it. There has to be... Um, what, like you, conquest? No, I mean, no. I mean, there has to have been... Um, the, the way I understand the world uh, recognizes statehood and or the right to independence is got a, it's got a historical context. And our Western Cape, our history is really an arbitrary line that was drawn in the sand in 1994. 
because before 1994, the Cape was actually the Northern Cape, the Eastern Cape, yeah. and Western Cape. But this Cape exit is not talking about those Capes, which may be historically, you could argue, was a country on its own prior to unification in South Africa. It was. Uh, it was but, and, but now the Western Cape is not. The Western Cape was a compromise in 1994 to create nine provinces. This group that is talking about the Western Cape definitely doesn't want the Eastern Cape included no. because those people are the wrong color and the vote for the wrong party. So I think it's going nowhere and I think it's repulsive for many reasons, including that it has no his historical basis. Okay, but you, I mean, it's repulsive is a very strong word. It, so it is repulsive. Um, are, there, are there other parties that you're paying special attention to like mk what do you think their role is going to be because i always like to hear from the leaders of parties and from the people in, in prominent positions like you're the secretary general for good what do you think of all these people because we've got the competition jacob, yeah jacob zuma coming in it's easy for you guys to talk about your own party but you sometimes uh, get very honest answers from people in your position about the other guys so what do you think of mk making a lot of noise well i mean i'm let me say i'm been wildly impressed that they managed to to get where they got to so quickly and so quietly. Suddenly they popped up and they have a full list on the national list. You know, they've obviously been preparing for a long time and I think it's impressive. Um, I think they probably will do well in KwaZulu Natal. I see no sign of them really in, in the Western Cape. Um but um so I think they're an interesting mix in the in the competition of new parties who are wanting to enter parliament and enter the the provincial um, legislatures, but I am um, I, I don't see much of the, much of them outside of KwaZulu Natal. Um, but I must say it's impressive what they've managed to achieve in a short space of time. All right, anything else, Canton? There was a question that uh, came up in the comments, Gareth, which mm -hmm. was, you know, would uh, would you support um, conscription and then free university for those who go through the process? You get, you go through, you. So, in other words, you get become the, conscripted, and then you, then once you've served, you get free university. No. Like, like the taxpayer has to pay to make mm. a better society. Then, how about we put those people who are getting that payment yeah. into, you know, conscription, working in the military, getting some skills training at the same time, and, and then. It's it's not a bad idea. I haven't thought of it. It's not a policy of the party, but it. I mean, our policy is to support free education. But I am. Um, it's it's not a bad idea. By the way, what do you think of the closure of Damlin and all these other oh. institutions by Bladen Zimande? Well, I think um, it's good, and especially for those of us who have a small business in skills training, that um, dodgy colleges are closed down. Because and you it, think they're dodgy? They're all dodgy. Well, I don't think they're all dodgy. <laughs> I don't think they're all dodgy. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Pummy's pulling faces. No, no, look, I mean. No, I, no you know. Grace, okay. I'm going to let you continue with, with your train of thought, and I hope you don't forget it. I think, though, that there, there is something very dodgy in what we've seen happen over the past couple of years. This government is very good at breaking things and shutting things down and not so good at starting other things. I mean, I think when I think about Damlin, which has been around for a very, very, very long time. Yeah. And we know people who have been through that system. I think that there are lots of ways of fixing where there is a problem. And I don't know uh, how much of that engagement has been done with some of these organizations. I mean, even City Varsity, which is a fairly new uh, college and working in the creative industry, we have seen many young people come through that system and get into and be very viable individuals within the you know within the the business they had real business. skills for me and uh, i think that if you scratch past the surface like with one other minister that for many years everybody has thought he's the good guy i think if you scratch past the surface you're going to find a very dodgy experience with this particular minister and these organizations. Are we talking about and Pravin? Maybe, yeah, that Pravin. Yeah, and, sorry, and I FAA, to, I, we don't, we don't the, mince our words on this show. No, but I think, I, I, I think with Blade and with these particular colleges and with what has happened, I think if you scratch past the surface, you're going to find a dodgy deal there. I think that more than you're yeah, going to find I, dodgy institutions. I like, I really like the comment you make, 
But I mean, first of all, I say dodgy with, I mean, dodgy because according to the minister, they inflated their numbers. Um, and, but there is a, you, you're correct that he has a system that is broken by the state because I actually just asked a question recently to the minister of, of higher education around how much money is being collected from the skills levy. Now, the skills levy is supposed to fund the CETAs, which is supposed to fund people who are studying uh, vocational training. How much money has been dispersed? Well, and that's the problem. They're sitting on 14 billion rand in the skills fund right now, while you have millions of young people unemployed who should be getting learnerships at colleges that are accredited and properly run um, and funded through the skills levy that employers are paying. So, yes, you're right. This is something that has been broken by the state who have collected the money from employers. 14 billion rand is currently sitting in the bank um, while you have people who could actually be sent to accredited institutions and get qualifications using that money. And there are many administrators in that system who are getting paid a salary every month while those young people don't yeah, get yeah. the internships. I, mean, that they I can deserve. give you an example from my own business. As I said, it's a legal skills training business. A law firm wanted to send 20 or 10 of their 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 um, employees through our program, which is a paralegal skills training program, a qualification. They applied for the learnership in February 2023. Now they've been paying levies. It was approved only in March 2024, with still no sign of when we can start training these people. A whole year no, that this law firm has waited for, for to get their own money back that they paid in skills levies to train and, their staff. And, and in exactly the example that you give, which you can you have personal experience of, uh, lived experience, people would say, uh, the government is the bad guy. Because here is a law firm trying to do business. They're trying to do business with you, get qualified people who they want to be upskilled to work with them. And it can't be done because of government. Yeah, I agree. It's a failure of that system, failure of government. Brett, one I final still... question from my side. Would you agree that you're a socialist? <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've been called worse, but yes, I'm, I think I'm a, a, what do they call it, a democratic socialist. But right. our party is a social democratic party. So. Give me an example of a place that you would use as a prototype, a role model for the type of society we should grow in South Africa. No, I think looking was, around the world, what country would you say you are using as a model? And even in history. Emulate? No, I, I don't think I can do that because I think we must we must stop trying to emulate what other countries Northern Hemisphere have done. South Africa oh, has has really a, says a Northern Hemisphere well, anywhere in the world. I mean, Let South Africa be. has a unique history, and we must find. Um, we must solve that, solve the the legacy of that history in our own unique way. And to some extent, part of that involves um, some social interventions, which may make me a socialist. Um, but I'm not going to say, well, Norway is this um, utopia, um, because it's not. Um, and um, I don't know of a country that has gone through what South Africa has gone through that needs to address the kind of challenges and legacies that we have um, and I would like us to create our own unique response to those challenges. So 30 seconds to convince our listeners why they should vote for Antipat and Good. Because South Africans are suffering and we all have a responsibility, whether we have means or not, to ensure that those who are suffering um, receive some support from the state. And in order to achieve that, we need to grow our economy, grow um, our employment. But in the meantime, while we're waiting for that economy to grow and for jobs to be created, we need to, we need to take care of those who are excluded and left behind. Very interesting stuff. Uh, we can't uh, accuse you of not answering things. Um, some of your answers might not be to everyone's satisfaction. I think we've gone pretty much all the way we can. And I wish you luck for the election, as Thank I have you. everybody. Thanks very much. Um, it's going to be a hell of an election. I think everybody's of the opinion that this is the most important one in a while. Yo. Let's see what happens. You know, what? one thing we did not speak about today, which I did want to talk about, is the 42 people who are appearing on multiple party lists. But that is the story for next week. Well. Come back next week. We'll talk about we'll that. We'll have more for that. All right. Thank you, everybody. We will see you next Thursday. And uh, also, good luck for the long weekend. Tomorrow's Easter for those celebrating that. Uh, for those people who are just looking for a nice weekend off, whatever you your got reason. That too. Yeah, we don't judge.